the other thing I think I'd say was a major turning point that was completely different, although I've already touched on it as a turning point, is the getting involved with the beloved carers, um, what I previously called turning point six, it's provided me with an opportunity to get to know five very different races and eight very different individuals. You might think being the same race, they're very similar, but actually they're all very different. So I've been able to learn many, many things from them, and I've learned about other worlds, and I've been able to visit these other worlds in, in the way that I was able to visit them. And ordinarily, I don't think I would have been able to visit those worlds for one reason or another. Well, maybe I could have, but this made it easier. Now, the other thing that happened is I was able to see two worlds where the dominant life form became extinct and uh, I was told about what led to those extinction events. I was shown the historical artifacts they left behind. I was told things about their culture and it was a very moving experience. Now if you combine what I learned from that with my interest interest in the population issue and what I learned about the population issue and merge the two together, what you see is this, at least this is what I see. I learned about how certain dominant species are allowed to have their time. And then sometimes after intervening and helping them survive for so long, so many times and so many occasions, the ETs will say, okay, they've had their time. It's time to let other species or uh, other life forms dominate. So let's step away and let things happen. So that helped me to understand, okay, where are we at in humanity? We have these looming crises all converging together and everything, you might say, is underpinned by the population crisis. The population crisis we have is causing so many secondary problems. For those who believe in climate change, anthropomorphic global warming, which I personally don't, did for many years, then I converted, then I start to think about it differently. For those who see these problems and see the link with population, you will realize that there are existential threats to humanity. And if we are to survive as a species, we must overcome those existential threats. So there are external existential threats and there are internal existential threats coming from us, basically, and what we have done to our world. So having seen what happened on two other worlds, I began to look very differently at what has happened on our world and what could happen. And so it's made me acutely aware of where we are heading as a species and why people like Elon Musk are completely wrong about this planet's fucked. Let's go and colonize another world. For starters, it won't be allowed by the creator races. And I've been told we, we have to appreciate what we've got. We have more than enough here. We won't be allowed to go and fuck up another world. And the other thing is, we don't learn anything if we go and do that. We don't learn how to deal with our problems, be they the physical problems we've created, like disturbing the landscape, like destroying ecosystems and other species, like having a runaway population. And we haven't learned how to get along. We haven't learned to sort out human conflict and to smooth out human relationships and then extend that to other species. So I learned a lot about us from looking at what has happened to other life forms. So that was a remarkable kind of gradual turning point for me. Now, apart from the different turning points, there have been many experiences, all of which are unique in their own right. And uh, some are very similar. Everyone is completely different. 
as I said, there have been many experiences, and I'm still trying to document some of those experiences that I'm only just now remembering. There are others I remember, I have them all documented, others that are still coming to the fore. But there are ten that I'd like to add to what I've already told you about. I think there's some merit in telling you about them. So I mentioned earlier about contact with the insectoid beings, um, January 95. I mentioned that we had lost this time. What I didn't mention is that at the time, Rachel was conscious during the encounter, and I was, she described me as being semi-conscious, uh, I was zombie-like, and we were being examined on a table, and an interesting thing that occurred is that she said across from us there was another table, and there was a whole bunch of wild rabbits, now in Australia rabbits are an introduced species, so there were these feral rabbits on the table and they were also uh, being examined in some way and when these beings examine you they do it in a very unusual way and they will use their hands but one thing that they do a lot of is they will bend over and their head will be very close to your body and their head will move from side to side now when i've heard people talk about mantids I don't buy that there are praying mantid beings. I just don't buy it. But one thing I will say is the way that the mantid moves its head, if you pay attention to praying mantises, and they happen to be one of my favorite insects, you'll see that sometimes they have this swaying motion with their head. And I'm not sure what they're doing, but I think there is something they're doing in terms of perception, picking up on energy a particular way, perceiving with one of their senses in a particular way. So that's what these beings seem to be doing. So that was a very um, powerful experience for me to start to think about the, the biology of these entities. Okay, the second uh, set of experiences, there's not just one experience, it's a set of experiences I want to tell you about is what I refer to as the pig squealing ET, pig squealing alien. And if you've listened to the something monologues, uh, you'll know that the first episode of that, way back in 2014, um, was on, was at least partly on the pig squealing ET. And what had happened is, uh, I can't remember the exact date now, but I had, at an earlier point in my life, um, early 90s, I'd gotten interested in crop circles, and I was particularly interested in, in them as symbols. So I had, I'd copied parts of Colin Andrew's earlier books and read a couple of other books, but I didn't really get into it in a big way. Then something happened some point after the birth of my son and I got into it in a big way and then I started documenting it and I set up a national network but I didn't really do anything with it and soon that fell over but I was traveling everywhere looking for them in the landscape and mapping anything I saw and mapping what had already been documented by other people and I began to see these strange geometrical patterns on a large scale I think I made a video about that at one stage, about what I had learned. But over time, um, I began to look at the whole crop circle phenomenon completely differently. And I realized that actually, even though this was my initial thought many years before, I had jumped on the whole crop circle bandwagon and believed it to be true. I thought a small number were fake, but I thought it was true. But I came full circle to realize that nearly all of them were man-made. I had looked very carefully at the man-made ones and the people that were making them and what they had said about them and realized this is not what I thought it was. Even though I had strange experiences and sometimes there had been a crop circle up here uh, in the early days it happened here, but the, this happened overseas that correlated with what I'd been exploring. I realized, no, it's not, uh, not what people think it is. They don't need to 
make this thing which I had thought was a Rosetta Stone of consciousness. I don't need to make crop circles in bread that's consumed by humans and transform consciousness in that way or by having them go there. This is a human construct. Some of the best art on the planet, but it's a human construct. If there are any that are real, they are simple circles and they are probably some sort of saucer nest. So Doug and Dave, when they came out to Australia and saw the Tully saucer nests or heard about them, went back to England and started making them. You know, I think for the most part, that's the origin of it. And the talk of the mowing devil and the earlier ones, there's something else going on there, some natural phenomenon. This is a man-made construct. Um, unless humans were making them back then, and that's also possible. Why not a couple of boys in the 16th, 17th century making them? I'll come back to where I was talking about. It began with my interest in the crop circles, and I was going through this heavy period of documenting them. And uh, I had been out walking with my ex and seen a scar tree. Uh, we had numerous Aboriginal scar trees on the property, and I asked, do you think that could be one? And the very next day, I was walking the same area, and there was an arrow pointing right at the tree I had talked about, an arrow that had been made in the grass somehow. And I don't remember now how long after that it was, but after that, we began to hear, within a couple of days, we began to hear this screaming sound. And it's 100 metres in front of the house, 100 metres behind the house, you know, the whole thing is K long. And then there's a creek area, which is longer again. And so... It would start on one side and move to the other, and this thing sounded like a, a pig squealing and at the same time a cockatoo screaming. So it was like something was eating a cockatoo that was screaming, but squealing like a pig. Now I had heard foxes for many decades, and foxes make some bizarre sounds, but this was something else. This was much louder, penetrated the house. There were three of us here hearing it. And it was quite, quite daunting. Um, I went outside, I started to follow this thing, and uh, it walked very rapidly. And I was hearing the sound of breaking branches. And there aren't any branches on the red gums, down at the ones that we had at the time, down low. They're up high. So it seemed like it was also up high. Now, many years later, I was to hear that my, my father-in-law had described the same thing back in the 80s. I didn't know that then. So this thing was moving around the property and went in the direction it would move that dogs in the neighbours in the neighbours' properties one, two, three Ks away would go off. And so there was something going on and also Rachel saw this huge ball of light that would initially uh, go over in front of the house and then travel down over the trees. And so then uh, I had continued to pursue the crop circle thing, and I thought somehow it was related to that. I didn't know for sure. And then when we moved to Port Ferry, uh, I had a similar experience. It was there, not far from my house, when I was walking on an area called the Rail Trail, a former railway converted to a walking trail. And I heard it several times, and when I, one time when I got back, uh, apparently my dog had been barking his head off, but I hadn't heard him and I had been close by. I thought that was really odd. Um, another time the dog had not reacted and I thought that was even stranger. And then when I got to Hall's Gap, uh, I would hear it walking at the back of the contact area and going through the little forest and around through the forest and once again hearing all of these breaking branches. Now at that point, I'd heard from somebody, Todd Michael, I think, about uh, bat squatch. And I had had an experience of this something being on the top of the roof, in front of the window of the bedroom, and fly down, but I never saw it appear. It just disappeared, and it was like human size. So I think Mothman, something like that, maybe. And we had experienced something flying above us on top of an area called Reed's Lookout. 
So all these odd things were happening, and uh, I had had dreams about this entity, uh, some precognitive dreams of it appearing in a particular place, and the next couple of days I discovered that place quite by accident, and I uh, heard strange noise that appeared to be coming out of that rock uh, I couldn't explain. So the essence of this story was that there were three sites where I was hearing this same entity. Um, later I learned that it was a particular ET of an ET race. Uh, I don't think I've spoken about it on the blog, but it had the appearance that would, I guess, terrify most people to look at, quite a scary looking entity, but it wasn't attempting to be scary, and, and its voice was blood curdling, absolutely blood curdling. I tried to find evidence of this on the internet, and I think I found one person who re referred to something similar, I think it was in Gippsland on the other side of our state, but that's all I ever found, I didn't, it was just a very brief couple of comments. So. Very strange entity, blood curdling sound. The images that I saw in my mind, kind of terrifying to behold. And it seemed to want my attention, our attention, my attention for some reason. And uh, very unusual. So the next experience I want to tell you about took place in. In uh, 2007, I was uh, in Port Ferry, and I would go every day for walks on Griffith Island. And I would often go to a small beach at the back and walk to the highest point where there's a uh, wooden triangle. And I would sometimes climb that triangle, especially when it was windy. I loved doing this, and I would put my arms out in cruciform, stand at the top, and sort of feel like I was flying. You know, lovely feeling. And I would often do chikum at the back of the island, walk in the water, have a swim, all that sort of stuff. Anyway, one night I was up uh, at the top and I was meditating, having a very still, very quiet time. And all of a sudden, images started into my mind and I felt myself moving very fast through the ocean. And I got to a point, I won't say where it was, but let's just say it was between Australia and Antarctica where I saw this cruciform-like structure on the sea floor, and uh, I was taken inside of it, and there were a colony of beings living there. And, uh, and I saw what looked like elders talking to children, and there were some birds nearby. They had some birds that lived in there with them. They just looked like uh, sparrows. There were some other birds too, but these ones look like sparrows. And so I, I, I was, I knew sort of what they were saying, although I didn't understand the language. I, it's like I understood this story. I won't, won't ever talk about that. But these beings were um, not like anything I've ever seen. And then after, I don't know how long. How long it took place? Half an hour? Something like that. My mind moved out again and, and I was back there. So that was quite an unusual experience. Then on the 3rd of April that year, the beings that we refer to as the hoofy foot, Nupno, came to visit and uh, they seem to be after something. We've gone into this in detail before, so I won't now, but they seem to be after something in the house. And they seem to be after both hairs from my hairbrush and uh, scrapings from the bath, which I, I took to be cell scrapings or something. And uh, at one point, they realized they had been seen. They were invisible, but... Rachel was seeing them die, and I couldn't see anything. And when I went in my bedroom, the drawer was left open where the brush was, and I never leave it open. So that was kind of confirmation. And then afterwards, after we were looking at this entity and it realized we can see it, things went quiet for a bit, and then we could hear noises on the veranda, like feet, strange feet moving along the veranda. It went out, nothing to see, but the noises continued. 
So that was kind of interesting, and I didn't know what to make of it. And then, so this is April. In the June, I have a major incident where I pee blood in a public toilet, and I discover I have a massive swollen kidney and a massive six centimeter tumor in it. In August, I end up having surgery and then discover I have renal carcinoid cancer. And afterwards, I went back and tried to connect with the event. And there's some other uh, methods that I practice. I don't want to call them remote viewing because maybe that's not the best description. But I was able to view these events. And what I saw was that the Nabna were taking these materials and then they were cultivating healthy cells. So I always felt that had something to do with my illness and if things should go really bad, there is something they plan on doing. I don't know what it is, but I'm alive after 17 years when many people with my illness are dead. Now, I don't credit that all to ETs. I've done an awful lot to stay alive, but there was something about that event that had to do with my health. So the next event were two, two events actually that took place in April 2009 whilst I was in Port Ferry. I was um, walking on the rail trail at the back and I was with my son Toa on both occasions. Now on one occasion we saw what we thought at the time was a meteor, this big blazing ball of light, massive like house size thing go over our heads a couple hundred meters over our heads and then off into the distance and then uh yeah uh no i'll say any more about that yeah so that was very odd and uh, i later learned that that was what we were supposed to remember but that wasn't what actually took place now a few days after, there was another event where I had stopped for a pee and Toa was on his bike a little bit ahead and there were some cows behind us and I heard this noise and saw this light. It was like an explosion went off behind us. Toa had seen exactly what happened and turned around and there's a herd of Angus cows there. I think they're Angus cows. And they were running in all directions, totally freaked out. And when I went back and remembered what had happened, what had actually happened is the ball had come up towards the path, turned into a much bigger ball of white light. He had seen an exploding pink ball. It's funny, a few years later in Old Scap, I saw the same thing in a distance um, over a house somewhere. I don't know if something happened to somebody else or something else was going on. Out of this large light came numerous entities and then we were taken on board. So both occasions onboarding encounters. And um, during one of those we were being taught about particular symbols and ways of um, understanding knowledge. But these days I think of it as symbolic loading, and I'll explain that somewhere else another time. And Toa was being taught, my son Toa was being taught, and he was only about 10 at that stage. He was being taught, he was very much into games, you know, electronic games, the games that kids are into. He was being taught something about technology and ways of interacting with technology and they had created for us what looked like two very nice looking computers almost like apple computers with these big screens and mouse so that this is what the ets do they will create technology you are familiar with for you to interact with and we could ask all kinds of questions anything we wanted to ask we could ask and so i learned a lot about them through that experience there's still other things that i haven't gone into in that experience. I need to do a lot more to try and understand it. Then um, 
on the 10th of November 2009, and this is the day after the sale and visit in the backyard, and I was in Halls Gap um, with a friend uh, in a rental property, um, holiday rental property, and suddenly these beings materialized in a room, and these are the beings I've called the Salon with the wide triangular shaped heads, and I could see um, numerous entities standing at curve white consoles and in the background it was like there was glass and in the background you could see a red planet I'm not going to say it's Mars it's not Mars and um, they were standing at the consoles and sometimes they would come over and they would look like they were touching heads communicating in some way now the Salon, one of the groups that I have contact with, one of the beloved carers, there are three of them there, uh, Shumpa, Quayland, um, I'll move the other one out for now, I have a reason for that, and um, yeah, so I, my, my friend was, I, I asked, are you seeing what I'm saying, and we confirmed that with each other, we've seen the same thing, and um, then they went downstairs and they said, this is for you. So that was surprising. And so I began asking them questions and they would answer my questions. And then I asked them you know, if I could look at them and if they could turn sideways and backwards. And that's so I got to, they were very obliging, I got to see what they look like. And um, uh, see their body in different ways and, and so they had this very open discussion with me now what I forgot to mention is I had asked for contact and going away that day I'd also photographed this object above the cliffs and it's ironic where I photographed it sort of pretty much in front of where I ended up living a year later um, down below but this was up high um, yeah, it's a, it's a well-known area in Hall's Gap. So I had this experience of seeing them just like what I thought had happened with the Telia, who at that stage we referred to as the Brownies because of their appearance. That's what Rachel had first called them. When that happened in 97, this entity in the room is like one space overlapping with another. So that's what appeared to happen this time with the Sal, and They had their space, and it was in our space it's very hard to say that it was occupying the same dimensions uh, yeah something about perspective was completely different so that was a very interesting experience then um, a month, sorry, I should have gone in the right order here. A month before this, on the 19th of October 2009, I made telepathic contact with, or I guess this wasn't telepathic, it was telempathic. I was able to see things with an entity called Tafu of the Asha, a human like uh, being based in southern England, a particular base, Rachel had worked with, and I got to know this entity and have a good talk to them. What's interesting about them is they have particular distinct facial features in terms of markings. That's all I'll say about that. So um, I got to know Tafu from an introductory perspective anyway, and to learn a little bit about who he is, how old he is, and what he's doing here. So the seventh experience occurred in Hall's Gap on the 12th of October 2013 with Telia. And uh, in this instance, when I was on board, I met a woman who was conscious and she was a fellow Australian from Western New South Wales, and we spent time together. I won't say her name, I won't say the town that she was from or near from, but uh, if that person ever hears this, please get in touch with me. And so we were both given numerous experiences, one of which being a health assessment, talking to us about how things are unfolding, how we're feeling, taken on tours through the craft. But something interesting happened. There was a young boy, I think he was 15, 
from southern Brazil, and a woman, who may have been in her 30s, from the nearby town of Ararat, which is about half an hour drive from Hall's Gap. And he was wearing shorts, and she was naked, and they were unconscious. And we were asked to say things to them by placing our hands on their chest and saying what we needed to say. And it just, in the moment, came what we needed to say came. And so what I sensed from that experience was these are people I will have contact with in the future. And I and this other person may be able to provide them with guidance. We were both encouraged to communicate to them. And so I think what we were doing in a way was implanting communications into them. Now, I don't know if that ordinarily works in people, that you can do this, put your hand on a person's chest and say things and whatever. What I do know is a body remembers everything. So maybe from that perspective, information can be planted in people very easily and when they learn how to work with their bodies they can retrieve it but it's also possible that the telia were doing something else but they gave us free reign and were encouraging us to say everything we felt we needed to say so part of what i said was who these beings were and that you will one day have experiences where you are aware and you start to understand and not to be afraid and that there are others like you who can help you. So that was a very unexpected and, and powerful experience. Then on the 31st of May 2014, I'd come back to the farm for a visit. This is prior to the visit with Dude where he took me away and had a very... Um, unusual and expansive experience and um, we'd had a fire outside Rachel was here with our son and uh, I was unable to see some of these entities but able to sense and see others and and to see all of them with internal senses now on my blog I've talked about how I've been able to develop other modes of perception including using certain internal senses some of those perceive energy, some of those help me to see things. So on this occasion there were four different races here and numerous craft that were here. There were not as many trees here at that time, there was uh, more space for things if they wanted to come down. And that experience went on through the night, including after I'd come in. and when the bulk of them left there was only a couple that remained after but when the bulk of them left it began to rain it, there was no rain forecast and we had the heaviest rainfall apparently in one night i don't know what that what i can't remember now whether it was for 150 years or something like that but it was just kind of bizarre really so that was the only real evidence I'd had of something having happened. And during that experience, Rachel had seen beings who were literally glowing from uh, the light within. And um, some of those beings were examining me. And uh, one of them seemed particularly saddened by something that was going on in my neck. And I have these, uh, I guess you'd call them cysts dozens of these little cysts that have occurred since I had my kidney removed and my diagnosis and I was told that uh, my body works differently now and excretes things in a different way sometimes into the surface layers of tissues below my skin so I don't know if they were reacting to that or something else we also had some very short ETs only several inches high and um, they were actually near the fire at one point and that was kind of a bit astounding to me that was uh, a very confusing night because it was like 
physical reality was coming and going. Luckily, there was another person who was uh, aware of something else. My son, he felt things, but he didn't see anything. Um, but there were three of us there, and the other person did see things. She could not see things, whereas for me, I had to tune into it. So the next uh, set of experiences wasn't just one experience, it was three separate encounters with the TRM took place between 2017 and 2019. And rather than going into the details of each one, what I will say is that these are the insectoid beings once again, and uh, they took us on board each time. And on one of those occasions, there were 19 humans on tables, all unconscious, all totally unconscious like zombies. So during that experience, I got to talk to numerous different entities that were there, males and females. Yes, they do have sexual differences. And I got to learn their names, how long they live, where they're from, more about their race and how they see reality. And I got to talk to an individual and I saw others doing it, but I watched this individual and I was talking to this individual who was manipulating fields of what looked like fields of light. And it was as if they were opening them like opening a book. And he told me that he was looking for things of interest in different spaces. So we have this idea of dimensions, right? Four dimensions, three of space, one of time. Totally wrong. You've got to drop time. You've got to drop thinking. Three dimensions of space. The sense I have is there are, I don't want to say levels of space, but there are different kinds of space, each with their own innate properties, characteristics. So I had a very good experience sitting talking with them, looking at things, pinching around the craft, observing their body. They're very happy to, to uh, respond to me when I ask, can you show me this or that about your body? And uh, so I learned a great deal about the TRM on those three separate encounters. I know there were other encounters with them, but those are three that stand out. And then the final experience I want to uh, share with you took place last year on the 26th of September 2023. So I mentioned the sexual abuse. So I was reluctant to talk openly about it for fear of being dismissed and not taken seriously. And then on the 26th of September last year, I went back with the intention of visiting my old school on the site of the abuses. But this is the day before I did that, the day before I went back to the second school. Remember I said I ran away and after I was suspended, I went to another school, had a much better experience. So I went to the school. I took Rachel with me because she had seen the worst of what I had to deal with after the abuse. And then we were driving back to the hotel in Picton and then something really odd happened and we felt like we were, had gotten stuck in a loop and it hadn't been possible for us to do this. It's like something odd had happened. Sometimes when you have experiences, you just know something odd had happened. Now on this occasion, I said to her straight away, something has happened. Something has happened. They've come. But I didn't immediately know what had happened and she was confused, and we pulled over, couldn't make sense of what had happened. And then we got back, and I was starting to remember things. And in a couple of weeks' time, she sat down, she was willing to look at things, but she didn't want to know everything. It was kind of very odd for her, because she tends to be conscious of everything that happens, and will know about it, but she didn't want to know about this. So what had happened is, we were stopped in the middle of the road. There was traffic in the distance coming, a few cars around. It was like time stopped. Uh, two Sawandi came up, the tall ETs, to either side, let us out, invited us out, said we wished to take you on board, took us on board, and uh, 
then they sat us down and talked to us about what is to come and some of that includes future human events, some of it was personal. And then for the second time in my life I was taken, but this time I was taken with Rachel through, I'm going to call it an artificial doorway, to merge with the light. And the sense I have is I was given this experience, A, because there were times after the initial occasion in 2011 where I forgot what it felt like being the light and I let uh, certain things like my health cause me concern, like sharing this sort of stuff and cause turbulence in my life and I backed away from it after going through a lot of dramas and um, and other things in my life and uh, and also because of what I had been through in the last two years plus a year before that actually coming up and, and facing my memories of the abuse so they wanted me to remember what I am my true nature I can't say why they gave it to Rachel but that's why they gave it to me And this was the day before, and before I had left, uh, we live a thousand kilometers away from there. Well, it's about 900 actually. I had asked to have an experience on top of the hill behind my old school. There's a hill overlooking. Uh, later I learned that I was so preoccupied with the ritual I was doing facing my demons, letting my demons go, I didn't really think to pay attention and look up and around. So, uh, even though there were craft there, they came the day before to give me what I needed. So I had a, a really great experience visiting my second school, and I knew the next day would be really difficult. didn't know how it was going to be, but I knew I had to do it. And, I, and part of the reason I knew I had to do it is in order to heal from my tumours, I knew I had to face this. I had to go back and leave no stone unturned and deal with the abuse. So this happening the day before was like, okay, you've had this good experience, and you've got a really difficult experience the next day. We're going to remind you of your true nature and that everything you experience in this world is temporary, is passing. So I had the uh, second experience of merging with the light. Now, after that experience, in the weeks that followed, I then sat down with Dude and talked to him about these experiences of being taken to merging with the light. How often do you give it to humans? And how does it work? What is it? What is the, the technology? What is actually happening? And who does it for whom? And so I learned a great deal about this ability they have and it's not an artificial construct if you're thinking they took me into some hologram and gave me an experience of uh, merging with the matrix and seeing outside of the matrix and all of this kind of stuff you've got to drop all of that conditioning this was not that at all the closest you will get to understanding it is understanding the buddhist concept of the ground luminosity the mother of all being but even that doesn't describe it, the felt experience. Well, actually, that's not quite true. Probably the closest you'll get to understanding it is listening to people talk about near-death experiences. That's why I call this a near-death-like experience. The people who have gone to the light, especially the ones who have had that experience of becoming the light, that's it. That's pretty much the experience. So... Those are just a small sampling of experiences. For me, it's gotten to a point where it's hard to keep track of everything. You know, I have journals where I document as much as I can, and I have regular sessions trying to remember things. There are some things I remember when they happen. There are some things that come back later. But it's easy to remember standout events, and then sometimes... I get confused trying to remember the details of individual events because unless I can put them in chronological order and really relax myself deeply, um, it all kind of blurs together. So it's easy to mess up the details. 
if sometimes you listen to my other videos and then you listen to me say something else and, and I seem to contradict myself, that may be why, because unless I've got my old journals out and I'm pulling them out uh, and going through every little experience I've documented, um, I, I do stuff up from time to time. It's inevitable. If I, for example, asked you to remember 500 events from your life, you're going to make mistakes. There's things you're going to get wrong or insert something with another event where it didn't happen and so th that does happen so in addition to a large number of experiences that i've had as i said it was up to age 20 104 and then even a lot more since I either remembered at the time or later i also began initiating contact almost 20 years ago and from about 2007 have documented hundreds of interactions I've had with ETs in the sky and some on the ground. Now most days or nights I talk to ETs, I send them messages and well wishes and there are times when there's no response, there's even times that go for weeks where there's no response and there's other times where there's an immediate response even before I think the question I know I'm going to ask something, but there's a response. Uh, I have times when I walk outside and it's like the sky comes to life and I haven't even said anything or thought anything. And sometimes those kind of experiences continue for months at a time without fail. So there's a lot of variety. Most of my experiences have happened when I've been alone, but some have occurred with my ex-wife or my son. Yeah, some have even happened with a couple of friends. I mentioned earlier the developmental continuum, and it's worth noting that whilst this is, um, is true, it largely doesn't apply until child innocence is lost. And then there's like this redeveloping kind of relationship. Now, I'm not going to say that all children are like that, all children have good experiences when they're younger because every child is different and some children don't. But often children have an openness to ETs in their presence and they internalise the experiences totally differently. So I've talked about nine periods and ten turning points and then some other additional turning points, but let me simplify my experiences into three different growth periods, what you might think of as early, middle and uh, later experiences, each of them with their own constellations of mental, emotional, physical and spiritual symptoms and side effects and phenomena. For me, or for you, When you look carefully, what you see is a gradual unfolding in the nature of the experience and the relationships. I guess you could create as many sub-periods in each one that you want, and that will vary from person to person. Some people getting stuck in the same type of sub-periods and others moving through them. In other words, some people really do go through growth periods and other people get stuck and for their life they remain in that same place. So now let me just touch on the, each of these growth periods and I'll start by saying something regarding the nature of my early experiences. I think I would say that they were playful and curious and I thought of them as the little people. There was an absence of fear and then later the fear began to dominate as other influences affected my life and my memories disappeared when the fear crept in. Now, regarding my middle growth period, it wasn't all the same. There was a gradual shift from a lack of conscious awareness to deeper awareness and the eventual development of fully-fledged relationships. It was very confusing, and on many occasions I was overcome by doubt, which became a real corrosive force that ran through my life, 
it was very painful and it forced me well beyond my comfort zone not just the doubt but the experiences themselves as i've said before there were times when i truly thought i was going crazy on many occasions i became obsessed with the subject and i had to remind myself to step back step back remember the rest of my life this will happen of its own accord whether i understand it or not so in this period what began as fleeting conscious interactions developed into partly conscious events and this high strangeness and that slowly and painfully developed into interactions with greater conscious awareness but it was still filled with all of these inexplicable anomalous events that i didn't see coming and i couldn't always account for before transforming into a kind of open contact and relationships and at the same time all of this high strangeness and inexplicable stuff has has continued it's not like it's not like a linear trajectory where suddenly you're just having open contact every day you have these relationships with 10 different ETs and it's like meeting your human friends it's not like that at all you may have that but you still have all the other weird things happening because contact with ETs brings about changes in your physical, emotional, mental and spiritual self, those aspects of your being. Not only that, the ETs will do things that bring about changes. Now to us, some of them look like magic, some of them look like synchronicity, some of them look like there is this invisible hidden hand guiding you. So sure, you can have open relationships, but the other stuff continues as well. And for me, I would say that I'm conscious 50, 60% of the time, but there are still events happen that I didn't see coming. And I have to go back and try and remember what happened. Now, every time I go back, something comes up. I always remember, but in the moment, I don't always remember. And I've talked many times before, there are many reasons for that. One of them is they dampen your memories for them to come up at a later time. Some memories aren't to come up, others are. Most come up eventually. Or they stop your brain from making memories. Or they alter your perception so that your ability to understand and make memories is hindered. There's a whole host of different things ETs can do to basically change how you are when you walk away from an experience. Now, in terms of the things I experienced in this middle growth period physically, um, they included things like strange marks, cuts, dots, lines, triangles, scoops, configurations of different marks, and sometimes a soreness after the sampling. Usually the soreness was in upper arm or uh, in my knees uh, I was semi-conscious or conscious in semi-conscious conscious states sometimes during high strangeness and contact events I saw balls of light in the house or outside or in the sky one thing I've touched on before in my blog and you don't hear about it when you hear people talk about this is when you are in face-to-face -face contact with ETs, you are overwhelmed by their energy and it will have all kinds of effects on your physical, emotional and mental functioning. For many people, it reduces you basically to being a blubbering mess, basically being highly emotional. All the stuff you've suppressed starts to come up. You're naked with them. There's nothing you can hide. And so that may raise questions for you, how do I deal with that with the later experiences I have. So I'll talk about that another time. I also had a lot of dreams about walls of light and ETs, and, and though some I took to be real, others I took to be symbolic. And this is one of the problems I see in this whole field, is that when people talk about ET dreams, it must be an ET. 
it must be what I saw. There's never an understanding of this being a symbolic dream, merely a symbol. Now, maybe it was a symbol given by the ETs. Maybe it came up in your own unconscious and it had no prodding from the ETs. I've had many dreams about Yowies, um, or Bigfoot, as Americans would refer to them. They were symbolic dreams. Now, in terms of physical experiences, also, there were lots of strange events that followed or preceded particular events. And there were really strange things like animals returning from the dead, what I initially thought of, what I used to call Lazarus events, or the Lazarus effect. Later, I realized that that wasn't things coming back from the dead. It was me experiencing other conjoined spaces. And I haven't talked about conjoined space much. I've mentioned on the blog. I will address it in this podcast. But uh, maybe another way of understanding is, is imagine that you go from one parallel universe to another very quickly, but the former no longer exists. And in the former, an animal is dead. In the latter, it is alive. I had experiences like that, and some of those were related to the ETs, and some of them weren't, so they were very confronting. Uh, the other thing that I've seen is amorphous lights on the roof. That's very confronting in your own house, inside, seeing them on the ceiling. Um, as I said, balls of light moving about a room, and during the day, uh, sometimes seeing single balls of light up high, sometimes seeing multiple balls of light in formation, sometimes capturing them accidentally when shooting uh, birds in video or something like that. Also having electronics turn on unexpectedly, things like stoves and televisions. When it's a stove, it's particularly alarming. Having objects disappear and reappear at other times. Uh, there's a couple of individuals involved in that. Having mental images appear very suddenly that involve different entities talking to me, knowing certain events uh, were about to happen that then happen, and, uh, and sometimes having synchronicities. But I wouldn't say that synchronicity is a big part of my life. So in addition to um, strange events, there's certainly been a lot of time distortions, what I've called contractions and dilations. In other words, time lost, time gained. And I've had, uh, even at that stage, in that middle period, there were events where things happened and no time was lost or gained. So if you want to look at the circumstantial evidence from uh, this middle period, I guess the things that jump out, it's not, not so much evidence that you can say this suggests something definitely happened, but in terms of personal evidence, it's, it's enough. One of the things, as I said, is these time distortions. Sometimes I get tones in the ears that are very strong and uh, other body sensations, some of which relate to things that I learned to perceive with my body, others I have no control of. I often get a very strong pain in the third eye area or above that area. I also developed this, I guess you, I think of it as a magnetic felt sense in the head that tells me when something be it a being or a craft is nearby, but it will move around my head. And depending on how I orientate my head, I will know the direction in which that that being is, whether it's an ET or a Yowie or a, a craft. And sometimes that will go off by itself and I, I know that uh, they're here. Of course, the obvious circumstantial evidence is the marks on your body that you can't account for. And I've gone through a lot to try and rationalize that and, and dismiss them because I know that when you sleep all kinds of things happen, natural things that create marks on the body and I've seen people in this field post photos of things that I believe happen naturally but they're convinced otherwise. I also became aware of 
biological implants that I have, and I've talked about implants in the past, so I won't talk about that now. Sometimes you see something odd before or after. I sometimes see strange objects as well, obviously craft and balls of light. I've even seen a, a, a ribbon shaped object that I couldn't account for that went into a cliff. One of the things that happens um, more frequently, I guess, is unexpected flashes of light, very intense flashes of light inside the house or outside. Sometimes even when I'm in a tent or a swag or even traveling in the car. And something that's very hard to account for is this strange feeling that something is about to happen or has happened. Uh, I remember coming home from work when I used to work in Horsham. I travelled to Halls Gap, uh, 75 kilometres. Sometimes having this feeling that something had happened and then seeing an image in my mind's eye of being surrounded by individuals and talking to them. And, and yet my conscious awareness was that I was driving or listening to some podcast or whatever. And of course, the best for me, circumstantial evidence is having flashes of memory right after. It can be you know, within seconds of an event or hours or days. Usually it's you know, within minutes or hours and it'll just be a snippet and then another snippet will come and another snippet. It's like a trigger and I often use those triggers to go back and remember the event if I can't access it another way. So in this middle period, in terms of events, the sort of things that, that were occurring was starting to meet ETs and meet more ET races and individuals. I was talking to ETs telepathically and telepathically quite a lot and uh, seeing ETs in my mind's eye in particular locations when I would go out to meet them or feeling their presence. I couldn't always see it a craft or a materialized ET, but I would see them in my mind's eye, and then other strange things would happen that would provide support to this being real in an objective way. And I mentioned earlier that, you know, sometimes other people have been involved, so the shared nature of these events has been a big part of that middle period, usually when I'm alone, but that have occurred with my ex-wife and my son, had them happen with pets, usually the one dog, but sometimes other pets. Poor Chico, he got to be part of more experiences than he probably wanted, and also two friends. And then some things have happened with friends independent of me, but after uh, meeting with me. I think in this middle period, as I said, there's been a a gradual shift in the nature of the interactions from normal things like an assessment of my health and information being implanted and sometimes I've been conscious during those experiences, sometimes unconscious. I've had discussions with them about many things and on the blog I've talked about all the kinds of subjects I've learnt about. They've given me explanations of things of interest They've taught me about my body, shown me things, taught me about the craft, taught me about who they are, shown me the human future, my own future, the future of the planet, future of people I care about. I've had those full tours of the craft, been allowed to interact fully with the craft, been allowed to pilot certain craft, given a room for my own comfort, been able to do whatever I wanted in that room. I was taken to merge with the light. That first experience occurred in that middle period. And I guess you'd say deepening relationships. It, it shifted from the sense of these are experiences to these are relationships. I am an experiencer to someone who has relationships. And the ETs have even helped me through some of the most difficult parts of my life. And I would say that, that in the last... 15 years, that has been the most important aspect of the relationship. And
happened in this middle period, as I said, I've had hundreds of nighttime sightings and interactions, some daytime sightings, and many conversations while I've been on board and telepathically, telepathically. So now let me go over what I think of as the later growth period. As I said earlier, many of the same things that previously occurred continued. Things like the unexpected events, the high strangeness, the relationships I'd developed with various ETs, like the beloved, the beloved carers, and a maker and dude. But I was starting to be given more opportunities to go off-world and spend more time on craft. I was given full access to the craft, different locations on the craft, the intelligence of the craft, and allowed open interactions with other ETs who were on the craft. After a request that I made, I was invited off-world by to, to about a dozen worlds, one of which I could access via a doorway about an hour from here. So for quite a while I went through the process of weighing up what do I want to do, where do I want to go, who do I want to interact with, and the beings who live on the other side of the doorway about an hour from here, the Shalom, they were very appealing, but they were there are features about them that are very uncomfortable. Uh, I've written about them on my blog, and in essence, you would say that they are a people who have effectively cloned human culture. You might say that they take on the culture of another race in the way that we wear clothing. We will try on some clothing that we like, and then another day try on some other clothing that we like and we'll have favorites and we might try something completely new in different times of our life we'll try different things and so for them taking on the culture of others is almost like a immersion in a special kind of art form it is an art form that they've perfected and they're very unusual beings. They're very thin, much thinner than us. They're about 10 foot tall, very angular looking. Everything is big on their world because of their height. Uh, but they have this culture that, that replicates owls or, or different parts from different time periods of owls. And in other points in their history, they've replicated other cultures. So after much deliberation, I declined that offer. I thought it was the easiest offer to take up. They're only an hour from here, that doorway. But I decided instead to accept an offer to visit Nelsi 35 which is Dude's World, because I knew the Nelsi well enough to know that they were easy going to be around and things would be comfortable. So I first began with several trips on his craft. They were what he described as slow trips of about two weeks so that I could see things. Ordinarily, it's a very quick trip in under half an hour, but they made it slow. And uh, then later, after that, uh, he took me directly. And that's as simple as what I described earlier, him taking my hand and then we reappear there. Now, as I've said, his planet, a solar system in a galaxy that's beyond the reaches of anything we've documented in any possible way. It's a long way away. Now, other entities I've had experiences with, their, their worlds, their home worlds, are much closer to ours. Some are very close. Dudes is very far away. So, uh, when he took me by craft, when he took me directly, I was given a, a house, a guest house, that I could inhabit. I'm allowed free movement over Nelsi 35 with support when I need it from his family or other people. I can go to other places. If there are dangerous places, I need that support, and there are dangerous places. If there are other places in the world, Sometimes I'll go with family, sometimes I'll go with friends, sometimes I'll be 
put in touch with other Nelsa and they'll look after me. I'm provided with the means to travel by the by Dude himself and by the House Intelligence. I'm going to refer to it as the House Intelligence because that's the easier way to think of it. So not only do they facilitate travel but also share knowledge and history and of course his family and his people have shared a lot of knowledge and history. So all of my experiences so far there are recorded. One of the things you need to know about me is I record a lot of things. I don't record experiences I'm having with ETs, but I've recorded family. I've got videos and photo record places I like to visit, animals I'm fond of, trees I'm fond of. I have photos going back to the birth of my son, you know, childhood photos. I got my first camera, 110 millimeter, 1980, I think. 79 or 80, 80 I think. And so I, I've been documenting things all my life. I got my first little cassette recorder uh, in the 80s. I record audio. I've monitored the sounds on this property, monitoring the involvement of sound on the property. So recording has been a big part of my life. So when I'm there, all my experience is recorded and it's recorded on devices that are created for me, but also energetically. And partly it's recorded through my experience. Uh, my mind is linked to the house intelligence. Partly it's recorded by the devices that they create and the things that I write down. Eventually I request that it's turned into books and they have these beautiful leather-like covers and stored in a space when I wish to access it. However, this is the thing you have to understand. Just as the TARDIS has more space on the inside than the outside, the houses have the potential to have more space on the inside. So it creates this doorway. It's a roundhouse. It creates this doorway on one side of the lounge room, reading room. When you walk outside the house, you don't see anything coming off the house. But on the inside of the house, this doorway leads to a very large area, like a large library, with a large archive, that is basically all of the things that have been created from my experience. Now, if the house is needed to be used for other visitors, all of that is taken away, disappears, or if one day I say I don't need it today, disappears, and it's stored, this information is stored energetically, and then the things are recreated when I need them. Now I have some of the books in the library uh, that's inside the house. Most of them are in this other large archive. So the one thing I've been told is they'll be kept when I die. Other ETs from other races will be given open access to them, and that will help them to know humanity through what I've left behind, especially a human who's out of his comfort zone and in about 300 years time there'll be another human being who's allowed to go to NLCI 35. Rachel was the first, I was the second, there'll be another. Eventually they'll, they'll say yes we'll invite other human beings and it may take, I don't know, 15, 1600 years until we have an open relationship with them. So recently, since the 16th of May last year, I started visiting in this different way. More recently, I've started visiting every two weeks and will do so indefinitely. So every two weeks, it comes, takes me, and I go there. What I want you to try and understand is imagine a vertical line, and that vertical line is your life. And every time I go to NLCI 35, imagine a loop comes off that line and that loop comes back into itself. So leave from the same time, come back to the same time. Go away for however long you want to be away, provided you know it's not a ridiculous amount of time where you're going to age and die, grow older and die. Think about the implications of that. Now the ETs can do the same thing, but they can do a lot more 
this takes a toll on the human body. So what I'm doing, and I was made conscious of this early on, is taking a toll on me gradually. So when I asked if I could visit another world, I was given this offer about a dozen worlds, and so I was told that there are eight worlds I can visit in this way. I'm not ready yet to visit them, partly because of the difficulties of being on worlds where the beings are very different, partly because I've got so much to explore with LCI 35 and with the NELSA, but at some point I will do that. In addition to having these now fortnightly visits, I continue my, continue my regular night interactions. Now I have periods in my life where I do very little of that and the last year I've done a lot more. I also talk to Enamika and continue to interact with the beloved carers when I have time and I talk to her two every few days. So you can see that there are three growth periods early, middle, later, and there's a natural trajectory there. And when I look back at it, it, it makes perfect logical sense how it's unfolded. Even the doubt and the uncertainty and the excruciating feeling of unrealness and that I'm going crazy. So I would not have guessed where it's, it was heading at any point, and I would not attempt to guess where it's heading from here. I, I don't know where you can go from here. But what I can say is that there is, has been a logical progression and the logical progression has only occurred because A, I remained open-minded and open-hearted and I kept my fear in check and I stayed curious. And I think I've mentioned I was a Buddhist for 15 years and so I did a lot of work on developing as a human being. I think what, if you look carefully at all of my experiences, what parallels this is a form of spiritual development that began with my love of the natural world and developed in a seeking journey that ended on the 19th of January 2011, that experience of being taken to merge with the light. And during that journey, from childhood up to then, I explored everything, shamanism, 15 years of Buddhism, neo Advaita various forms of mysticism, about two dozen forms of psychotherapy traditions, worked as a psychotherapist, before I eventually realised my true nature and the nature of the self. There is the one and the many. And if I look at it now, I think I would say the ETs are holding the mirror up to me. I am them and they are me. The self is discovering the self. God is discovering God. So I really have no idea where to from here. I'll continue my fortnightly trips to NLCI 35 for as long as I'm able. There may come a time when my body can't do it. I have a few more trips I'm allowed to take on Dude's Craft, and at some point I may choose to visit those other worlds that I've been allowed to visit. Of course other ETs will come and visit, and sometimes I know they're coming and sometimes I don't. I've been told that one day near the end of my life I may be allowed to take or to have some evidence and start sharing it, but I don't know how I feel about that at this stage. I'm not comfortable with that. And part of the reason I think that I've not been allowed to share evidence is because once you start sharing evidence, your life comes under greater scrutiny. And I've already had enough negativity through this whole sharing experience. The minute you share evidence, that's amplified. And I don't know that I want to go through that. And certainly the ETs have said to me they don't want to see me go through that. So whether it happens or not, I don't know. The one piece of physical evidence in my possession is something that will remain forever out of the public eye.
but there may be other evidence in time that's worth sharing. I just don't know. I have nothing to gain by sharing evidence. Yeah, okay, maybe more people will believe what I have to, to say about my stories, uh, about my life experiences. But I don't care. People either buy it or they don't. Lots of people will think that I'm crazy or delusional and would dismiss me, and, and that's okay by me. That's their choice. What I share may strike a chord of truth in other people now and in the distant future, and it's for these people I share my experiences because I know from my own experience there are people who either genuinely want to know and or people who need guidance. So I want to offer them something. There's something there to guide the people who need to know. I will continue to teach people about the nature of ETs and how to have their own experiences and relationships. And I will try to continue to offer an antidote to the stupidity, at least for a period of time. I foresee an end at some point. Later in the podcast, I'll go into the details of some of my experiences and some of my relationships. I'll also talk about how the ETs uh, help you with the pragmatic side of things. What I mentioned before, how you breathe, how you cope with foreign microbes, how to cope with different gravity, etc. For now, although it's been a very long one, this is merely an introduction. As I move through the different subject areas of this podcast, you'll develop a better foundation for understanding the particulars of individual experiences and things will make more sense. You'll also come to understand why I felt the need to offer an antidote to the stupidity that passes as authentic experiences and observations about the nature of ETs and why I use the term ET rather than the now fashionable non-human intelligence. So that's it for this episode. Thanks for taking the time to listen Next episode will be the first episode in a nine-part series on models of the cosmos. If you like what I have to offer and you'd like to support the show, consider making a donation or taking out a subscription starting in episode four. Till next episode, have a wonderful day of human life. I'm Bright Garlic. Cowabunga, people of Earth. Mm-hmm.